Hello, hello everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to Little History. I am joined by a guest this week. Do you want to hey. introduce yourself? Um, yeah, you're, um, I'm the guy you know as Sakardos of, um, Adam's channel, maybe others. I'm a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh. I study early modern colonialism, especially Spanish, but also uh, recently French. And um, I look especially at marginalized people, so I look at black history, indigenous history, queer history, stuff like that. And so yeah, I'm, I'm really curious to see what this game called New World is about. Might it be colonization? I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I haven't really managed to catch much of your previous streams of the game, Adam, because I was kind of busy with the whole PhD thing. Yeah, un understandable. So it ha I'm, I totally I'm going get it. in mostly blind. Yup, which is ideal. So as we load in <laughs> here, uh, let's give a brief rundown for anyone who is, you know, also not made it into a lot of the streams as to where we are and what is supposedly happening. Now that is a look. I, I look fabulous. I will accept no criticisms of my fashion sense. I said it <laughs> is a look. <laughs> uh, so, the, we are on the island of Aeternum, which is somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the where specifically varies depending on where you are looking in whether you're looking at the in-game map, or the Amazon website map, or somewhere else. I claim it for the Canaries. Uh, we're thinking it's the Azores, but yeah. Uh, so, the most recent thing of uh, settlement attempts uh, appears to have started primarily uh, with the historical colonization of the New World. Uh, mm. and has continued into the current year, which is 17-something or other. Mm. Right, pretty late. We're in seven because New didn't exist, and Microscopes exist. Wow. So, we're, seven we're 18th century. Uh, that being said, we are a random-ass uh, pirate. Let's see, we are, what, a uh, pirate monk duelist? We're tonsured, therefore we're a monk. All right, sure. Uh, we're wearing pirate pants, and that means we're pirates. Mm -hmm. And we're using a rapier, therefore we're a duelist. So we are a pirate monk Very duelist, uh, who traveled with an English conquistador to New World and shipwrecked there immediately. Excuse me, an, an English conquistador. Yeah, yeah. How, how did that happen? I don't know. Uh, he's very, he's got a very English name, though, and he sure as heck uh, was wearing a Morian with a bearded faceplate and, uh, like, early 16th century breastplate. That's interesting. So we have super, super I, I... English name, super English accent, uh, Spanish. I, I know I know of, of Spanish uh, Spanish people getting involved in English politics and, and stuff, but I, I know of, of German mercenaries uh, being hired by the Spanish uh, for the conquests. I do not know of any English people in Spanish employ in my period. So that's kind of creative, I guess. It's, it's extremely creative. <laughs> Let's see, where are we supposed... We should... Four hundred... Let's go do main story. Also, yes, Raptorus helpfully points out that we were shipwrecked. Uh... And on that beach, there were Viking longships, Chinese junks, and at least several galleons or ships of the line, or I don't know European mm. ships well enough to comment. Yeah, but so I mean the the aesthetic is all over the place. Exactly, we know that like there are this. Romans that have made it here, hmm. and so a whole lot of just stuff. 
Yeah, also the, the settlement. I mean, I'm I'm definitely not an expert on, on architecture or stuff, but that looks very mix and match. It's, I mean, I can get more mix and match. Turkey. Look, look at this early modern waddling up, actually, probably late medieval waddling up on a stone foundation next to this 19th century American longhouse. Or yeah. American log cabin, I should say. Yeah. With zombies. Oh, we've got zombies. Oh, yeah. So, in Aeternum, nobody can die except for all the people who become undead. Okay, so the the fountain in the loading screen wasn't wasn't just for for funsies. It, uh, it has a bit of a f immortality, eternal youth theme then. Ponce uh, de Leon and all that stuff? A, a little bit. There is no fountain no. of youth that we have to go to drink from. It just works. Something about the island just magically for reasons makes it just work. That... that... I mean, I find that kind of interesting. Um, especially because this is so clearly a fantasy and not a... a historical depiction of, of colonialism. Because that was really one of the major roles that the Americas had for people in Europe who didn't go there. It was a place of fantasy and it was a place upon which uh, this this genre of utopias was developed. Mm -hmm. um, very often, for example, with uh, uh, Thomas More, um, uh, a utopia would be implicitly or explicitly set in the Americas. Um, so this, this idea of a land of immortality being, being colonized, that does certainly connect to some literary and philosophical themes of the time. Wait, what? Why am I not doing damage to these guys? There we go. Yeah, Raptors rightfully points out that it could be the moisturizer of eternal youth. True, true. Hello, hello everyone. I'm seeing lots of people come into chat and I am super appreciated. Enclave Microstate, hello. Welcome from just seeing you. How are you doing? Morgan, welcome. Long time no see. The game has gotten no less wild. Oh god. No, don't. Oh god. That's that's worse. I despise... Enthralled Wretcher. What a terrible... What a... Oh, we... Absolutely. We're them enthralled. I guess it's kind of better than calling them zombies, which is really appropriative. I mean... Y yes and no, in that they're using... Right, it's just this area that has called them enthralled. Uh, they use right. a whole bunch of random-ass names uh, for the different areas. But I don't love it because, I mean, a throat is a specific... Uh, yeah, no, it's. I'm not saying it's great, but um, it's, it's always especially ugly. Um... When, when it ends up being appropriation from, like, very, very marginalized cultures. Exactly. I super agree. Mm. Try... Uh. Come on, let me eat. Let me... Uh. And there went the... There went my health regen from trying to eat because, uh, oh no. Oh no, we have gotten already way off the rails. And unfortunately, if we get too far away, they're just going to retreat, and then I can't kill them for the experience. That is so sad. I know. <laughs> See, just like that. They fully heal the instant they run away, when they get too far from their spot. They just heal. That's annoying. It's extremely. I hate it. 
It's actually what, my what, least favorite what mechanic the, in the game. What, mm, what are the glowy things there in the background? Uh, the uh, mushrooms are some flavor. All right, all right. I do enjoy this mushroom. They are no. Uh, they are shock bulbs. Electrical tulips. Look a bit like artichokes. They, they do look like artichokes, actually. Uh, Microstate asked if if the game subscribes to the longbow superiority theory. Longbows being superior to, to muskets. I don't didn't know. know. Don't know. We haven't actually... I'm not high enough level yet to use this musket to find out. So once I find out, I will let you know. Also, I only have eight bullets. Which is a problem. So, solidly, I. We shall find out. So, yeah, uh, lynxes, uh, divine lynxes, I'm sorry, electric artichokes, and all of that. Uh, maybe, maybe I should talk a little bit more about, like, the imagination of the Americas in Europe. Do it. That would be awesome. Because um, it's it's kind of uh, it it really starts with uh, with Asia instead of the Americas, because since the ancient Greeks, European minds had filled Asia with with monstrous and miraculous creatures. Just think of uh, Herodotus and his goat-eating ants, of the manticore, of giant worms in the Indus River. All these stories that the that the Greek told, and then you have in the Middle Ages a, a fake travel accounts of Asia, yeah. like like that of John de Mandeville, um, and that is Mandeville is still taken for fact by a lot of people in the 16th century, so that really informs uh, what people expect to find in places outside of Europe. So, um, there, there is a clear, um, synthesis between actual observation of, of strange and previously unknown, uh, cultural practices in the Americas, like, say, for example, uh, cannibalism, and stories about, um, about monstrous peoples that, that had been handed down, um, since uh, since the ancient Greeks, so for example, the Caribs, who are an allegedly cannibalistic uh, cultural group in the Caribbean and uh, in northeastern uh, South America, um, are in in art often represented as dog-headed, as cynocephaly. Mm -hmm. um, being being conflated with these creatures um from from ancient stories about Asia. And um then then you have stories like the Patagonian giants that people were still looking for in the late uh, 18th century. This this idea that it was basically just a game of telephone gone wrong. Because yeah, uh, archaeology has shown that the indigenous inhabitants of Patagonia, which is a region um, that stretches across parts of both Chile and uh, Argentina, um, they were um, taller than contemporary Europeans. Like as as one um, one uh, chronicler or or um, writer of whatever color cites the other. It kind of gets exaggerated more and more, and they're turned into giants uh, that, like, eat animals whole and, and whatever. Wow. Yeah. So, um, the Americas are filled in, in the minds of Europeans um, with um, with all these impossible creatures. And that that is one aspect. And the other is, of course, the idealization of the Americas as as paradise on Earth. In fact, Columbus himself speculates that um, the Americas contain the actual Garden of Eden. There is a 17th century um, 
Spanish um, monk who who writes a, a detailed account of of why the Amazon rainforest is in fact the Garden of Eden, and so on. So there there is this idea that this is a land untouched by culture. These people are of course savages, primitives, um, and thus untouched by sin, and and so it um it becomes idealized and it becomes yeah. a basis to build um, uh, utopian uh, ideas upon. So yeah, in a way, I guess you can take this game as um, not, not anything that actually happens that is like an actual colonization of a place and more like some, what's some random vaguely informed commoner in in Europe with no idea of of elite fashion and no idea of the actual Americas would maybe imagine that colonization in the so-called new world is like. That sounds about right. <laughs> Which, to be fair, you know, the reference primarily appears to be in a very meaningful way that we are looking at it looking back from modernity and having an mm -hmm. equally romanticized idea of what American frontierism was absolutely. like. Absolutely. Absolutely. All, all the stuff about historical cowboys. Um so that this this definitely continues this there, there, there is this this famous saying that the past is a different country and just as with different exactly. countries we keep we keep projecting mm -hmm. <laughs> um microstate asked to what extent was the reuse of tropes about asia a product of the initial misidentification of the americas i don't think it was very much um because that the misidentification gets cleared up very quickly like already during our uh, columbus's lifetime there were doubts about it and then by by the time of um uh, balboa and of vespucci it's it's pretty clear that this is not asia this is a completely um different continent previously unknown to europeans um but it is it is east of Asia, so a lot of as as um, Europeans get to know Asia better, they realize that all the stuff they expected to find there is not there. So clearly, America is still less explored. A lot of it just gets pushed further east. Like um, a good example of this is uh, the Apostle Thomas, who of all of the apostles is said to have gone furthest east to uh to preach the gospel and um for a long time he he was thought to have reached india but by the by the mid 16th century a lot of of um um a lot of uh, clergy uh, assumed that he had crossed the pacific ocean and had come to the americas and explained what they what they liked, what they approved of in uh, Native American cultures as having been taught to them by the Apostle Thomas, who had indeed gone furthest east all the way across the Pacific. So it's it's more that our Europeans in this age put a lot of stock in ancient uh, writings not just the Bible, but also uh, ancient Greek and, and Roman uh, authors. So it was really easier to just keep moving um, these these expectations to new places instead of giving up on them entirely. Oh boy, this guy is dominating me. Ow, ow. Oh. I'm sorry. No, he's over. He's stronger does, than does I am. Does he have a name? Is is he supposed to be something? He's the. Sh his name is the Suffering Remnant, which is not helpful. Okay, uh, so, so actually, he needs your help. Yeah, by maybe, me murdering maybe him. Try to sit down with him and, and talk it out. If he's suffering, maybe you can help him. 
Um. Sure. Yep. Definitely. Definitely gonna work. Uh. Uh, Leander Taker uh, uh, brings up if they're if they're without sin, as some um contemporaries, uh, especially um. Uh, Franciscan and Dominican um, clergy assumed why are Native Americans still seen as inferior and I guess we um, we have to make some distinctions there what we see as inferior and superior so for some and again this this is not like a, a general opinion this is one of several competing opinions at the time Yes, Native Americans are morally superior, specifically because they are seen as less intelligent, less developed. They are described as childlike, and thus they have childlike innocence. Uh, they, they don't know good and evil. Um, that makes them morally superior, closer to God, but very ill-suited for life in the air quotes of uh, real world. Um, so in a way, their mm -hmm. their um, cultural inferiority is a moral superiority. Um, but yeah, some uh, some uh, radical uh, monks definitely definitely see them as as morally superior. Um, others don't, and I mean, at least from a Christian viewpoint, they're they're kind of right because. Um, there is a lot of, of religious syncretism of um, of pagan, if you want to call it, holdovers uh, among uh, the indigenous population. So they are not the, the perfect little Christians that some imagine them to be. But yeah, here here just different different areas of being superior and inferior overlap. And of course, um, this feeds directly into the idea of the noble savage developed in the 18th century. Um, that basically because they are so simple, pure, innocent, like, like humanity was before the fall, they are doomed. Because in our sinful, broken world of today, the pure and good cannot survive. So we... we we shouldn't worry about them dying out because that's just nature. So um, you, you see how these seemingly positive attitudes are towards Native Americans actually feed into narratives that that excuse colonization. So it's, like I said, it's not a, a single current structure. There are um, there are computing views, but even the most radical don't really let go of some basic premises um, regarding um, the the superiority of Christian civilization and so on. Um, I mean, oh, one of God, the God, most God, radical God. radical ideas um, developed about about colonization were those of of Bartolome de las Casas in the early to mid 16th century, a Dominican friar who started out as a conquistador himself, then was shocked at the the violence he saw. Um, he he became a, a great advocate of the indigenous people, and over over the time of his life, he kind of radicalized himself more and more in, in that view. He, he started out uh, by saying, we, we, we can't just kill all of these people off before we can Christianize them. We're, we're filling hell instead of heaven with with what we're doing here and that is wrong to forwarding such ideas as we should replace uh, indigenous forced laborers with uh, enslaved Africans which which is from from today's perspective a really really shitty idea yeah to, to actually suggesting that Spain should uh, relinquish um its colonies entirely let let the indigenous people um, govern themselves and allow only uh, missionaries to visit them and no one else. Um, so he he went really radical, but even he insisted that these people needed to be Christianized, 
that they were not okay the way they were because you know you, you just you just don't turn suddenly into a 21st century person in in the middle of the 16th century that our basic premises you you can't entirely let go of, no matter how how far you take on these ideas and how radical you become Uh, for this dude asked about the Fountain of Youth, probably ages ago because I, I talked about that <laughs> that bit for way too long, but um, Fountain of Youth is... <laughs> um, I actually am not in quite informed on that bit, but I know there are scholars who suggest no one ever really believed in the Fountain of Youth and that it's kind of a myth that, that only uh, appeared much later. Uh, the the term Fountain of Youth definitely doesn't seem to appear in any of the um, documentation contemporary with the expedition of Ponce de Leon. Uh, I I just I haven't researched this topic. I can't really say if if the story of the Fountain of Youth already appeared in the 16th or 17th centuries, or if it is really just a complete late fabrication don't quite know about that but yeah generally um impossible paradisical or hellish things uh, were projected onto the americas mm -hmm. uh by the way uh dr zero shadow has a interesting point here i was told this game wasn't about colonialism and instead is between european equivalents that is, in fact, exactly why it is about colonialism. Yeah, colonialism right? was always a competition. Yeah, colonialism is not the sub... or is not exclusively the subjugation of indigenous peoples. It is the act of t claiming territory for the sake of European, primarily in this particular context, powers. Colonialism is something that erases indigenous communities and marginalized communities in favor of the European equivalents, or the European quote-unquote powers. Absolutely, I mean, you, you, can, you can also colonize a, a land that is truly empty, like, for example, yes. the Azores were or at the Iceland. time. Or Iceland. That, that is uh, colonialism in, in perhaps its, its oldest and simplest form. Um, yep. The idea of, of terra of just, nullius. Founding a new settlement out, outside um, your group's um, traditional territory. So in, in that way, um, colonizing is kind of morally neutral. It's, it's the stuff that, that comes with it when you try, especially try to settle uh, on land that is already inhabited that it becomes morally dubious and we we have to say that colonialism doesn't always mean settling in the way that especially the english in north america did it um right. portuguese colonialism was largely about founding trade uh trade towns or even just small trade settlements that you can't even really call towns uh as as kind of um bridgeheads to um, to trade with the locals, so you you don't need to um to uh, build a new city, build build a new country like the U.S. to be colonial. But yeah, col uh, colonialism was at every point about uh, competition. Like the first um instances of Atlantic colonization by European powers uh, are those of the Portuguese and the uh, Castilian Spanish and they already fight over over islands in the Atlantic so badly that the Pope has to step in and draw that famous line across the map mm -hmm. uh, saying everything west of this shall belong to Castile and everything east of this shall belong 
to Portugal and later they have to draw a second line because both of them start pushing into the Indo-Pacific as well and they, they have to decide where where the border runs there and then of course you have all the the powers on trying trying to grab land from the Spanish later on the French the English the Dutch are the the Swedish and Danish um all uh sometimes successfully sometimes unsuccessfully trying to to grab land that the Spanish had already brought under their control and I mean often it succeeded Jamaica was originally a Spanish colony uh, what today is is Haiti was uh, taken from the Spanish by the French and so on um so um colonies and colonial powers fought each other all the time uh, Florida was was Spanish then there were bits of it where where the French settled uh, and it was Spanish again then the English came and so on and so um, on and so on <laughs> yeah they they kept fighting amongst each other and that too had devastating consequences for the indigenous population just look at the u.s southeast where where basically um all these these uh, nations kept fighting each other trying to enslave each other because they they um um set against each other uh, by the different um european colonial powers so uh the 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 english tried to to ruin um peace treaties that had been uh, established between different um southeastern Native american nations so they would keep fighting and enslaving each other to keep that trade going so the the um rivalries and and interests of the european colonial empires um impacted uh indigenous americans terribly even um even when they were not directly ruled by europeans exactly well you made an interesting point earlier that i actually want to push back on on um, the idea of that there is a greater moral neutrality to terra nullius colonization or settlement colonization than there is to uh settling in lands that are already occupied there are some frameworks where this is super duper true, but um, there is still horrifying consequences to the land as That's a result true. of large-scale colonization. So a lot of what I do is environmental histories, uh, and so under that framework, you know, our classic terra nullius idealized colonialism of Vikings settling Iceland. Mm -hmm. Iceland lost 95% of its forest land in the first 50 years of habit of Norse habitation. Yeah, I guess I was going by more old fashioned idea of, of morality there that, that didn't quite uh, uh, of account course. For, for environmental <laughs> impact. That's true. E Eco histories true. are still very young and still have very, uh, very different understanding of morality, but uh, than the more human centric traditional moralities but it's worth mm. noting that the costs to the land that are inherent to primarily european uh they're not exclusively by any means european models of exploitation mm. and uh what it means to live in an environment that is intensely destructive yeah uh, that does have ethics attached to it that's true. That's absolutely true. As we ha very happily go around uh, harvesting a bunch of giant mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, fitting. fitting. Exactly. And oh. we're going to pet the cat, we promise. It's definitely just petting. Yep. Petting. Um, there's a bit of a discussion going on um, about colonizing Asia in... um in the chat and i just want to add yeah asia is more than china but even china experienced uh colonization in some 
way because the the century of humiliation was a thing and and china basically became a, a humiliated weak uh state uh exploited um through european <laughs> forced trade um yep. And so we're so, we're going to get a nice discussion into that because Enclave Microstate is a specialist yeah, in I'm, Qing China. I'm not, no, I'm not an expert on on that period. I just just wanted to comment on basically my point is that to to um exact colonial power, you don't need to um settle or or control an area. But yeah. How, how that worked for China, uh, in in particular, microstate can comment on way better. Um, I, I did not mean to encroach that. All I want to say is that the um, the, the opium wars and and all of that encroachment of basically forced trade between Europe and China that is another form of of colonial power. Yeah, that, that also must must be considered colonial uh, part part of that complex. That agreed. is my point. And the details of, of the whole China thing, I I, I, I will not and and should not comment on. Yeah, I, I think there's something to be said at least, an interesting discussion to be had either way you fall on it about you know the existence of places like Guangzhou, Canton, and Macau mm -hmm. as colonial entities. Mm -hmm. within a larger complex of diplomatic superstructures. And where that line gets drawn as to what makes it a... what would make Canton be a colonial structure versus a diplomatic one is very fuzzy, and I'm sure different interpretations will have different... or different theoretical frameworks will have different answers. But it's a conversation that's worth having. And thank you, uh, Seattle, Seattle Circus, uh, for the tier one subscription just now. I appreciate it. <laughs> We're just gonna run away. We're gonna keep running away. We're gonna keep running away. And we're good. Made it. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll just in in reaction to to microstate's commentary, I def I definitely um, retract the use of the of the term century of humiliation because that that is a term that is hugely political today that has been kind of overused by the Chinese uh, government amongst others. What what I meant by and large is that our Europeans did need not need to, to conquer or settle. China to enact a form of colonial power within it. Awesome. It's such a juicy topic, and it's, there's so many layers and different manifestations of what makes things colonial. Mm -hmm. And I mean, ultimately, like like all such analytical terms, it's artificial, and we we shouldn't. We shouldn't worry about it too much because in the end we we made it up and it describes what we wanted to describe and we <laughs> we have to just look at what things um what things are connected and whether they're connected because yeah as, as microstate just says because they uh, if they're connected because they're colonial or because they're imperial as long as we use these terms clearly cleanly and and make make sure everybody understands what we're referring to when we use them. On, on that it doesn't vein, really matter. What is if, your... If, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I'll let you if, finish here. If, if, yeah, just was just going to finish on a joke. It doesn't matter whether <laughs> we call it colonial or orange. We can we can start calling it all orange as long as we define it properly. It doesn't really matter, in my opinion. Fair enough. In that vein, how would you define the difference between colonialism and imperialism? That you, is a good question. You it, didn't you? Um, Stone doesn't I honestly, I, I like to stay yes. relatively vague about 
Empire. Been there. Um, Tomb it's the it's not a term I think I I use an analytically much. Um, and and like distinguish between this is an empire, and and uh, this this is not an empire. So um, I guess for me in in my own work, which is not necessarily empire centric, um, empire is just a a club that that certain um certain uh states. Um, I was aspire to be part of. So it's it's very much um like a, a league, or no league that so makes it sound like sound like they're they're uh, allied or something. What I mean is, it's it's like a certain tier. You have a certain level of power compared to other states. Um. Um, and they they recognize you on a certain level. So f that's, for example, the way that Henry VIII uh, uses the term when when uh, he he writes or has written um, uh, this uh, this realm of England is an empire. At, at, at this point, um, I'm not sure if he writes that before or after the English give up uh, Calais for good. But at this point. Um, that has practically no um no possessions outside what is traditionally seen as England. So how how is an empire, for example, with some people de define empire as like a state that what that controls um if you on multiple culturally I mean, different territories or something like that. Then friend. Henry shouldn't have I used that term. But how are we going to deny a historical figure? Um the use of the term we are trying to define. So yeah, for me, empire is more of an ambition than a reality. It's just what you what you want to be, um, I guess. Is it all right? Yeah, I'm I'm not good with with English history. Um, <laughs> and colonialism. Yeah, we we talked about it. It's it's basically um for me about. Um, yeah, about control, about the in invasion and and redefinition of uh, a cultural or physical um, space. So I, I f f for my uses, I, I would definitely speak of things um like um let's say um uh. The, the 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 Frankish realm are colonizing the the areas that are are uh, today southern France and and assimilating them. Um, so again, here I I'm in favor of a relatively broad view that just embraces many interconnected ideas. Um, awesome. Yeah, that. Right, for this dude says, uh, you know, in my experience of how the terms get used, colonialism is a subset. And I would dispute yeah. that. Uh, I think they're not subsets so much as they are closely related phenomena. It, it, it depends. For example, the the roots of the of the uh, term are, are with the ancient Greeks, and I'm not not sure every every ancient Greek city state um, that founded a colony really had imperial. Uh, ambitions often it was really just that the, the city was crowded and and you, you kicked some people out mm -hmm. um yeah it's complicated uh we're gonna go buy some bullets for our musket and by the way there is a question from actually two other things first night sky 789 for the follow five minutes ago i saw it i appreciate it thank you very much uh, the other thing, though, is uh, there was a question of our give. Let's see, where is it from, Doctor Shadow? Uh, let's roll up a hair. So, in the game, the world space is indeed a territory colonized by European standards. Actually, not just standards, just Europeans. Uh, and are they indeed abusing the environment and local order? As I murdered a bison for no reason other than I wanted the experience and because I had a gun, I'd say yes. 
I mean, you 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 are colonizing as soon, basically, as you as you found a settlement in in a new land, aren't you? Yeah. E effectively. Um, on, on, on some level, you, you can refer to that as colonization. Like I said, it that doesn't automatically um, translate to to doing something bad. Although, again, bad is kind of a useless qualifier historically. Um, it depends on on how you do it and where you do it. Mm -hmm. Um. Very, very yeah, much. This, I, I, I would say this. Even if if you can start debating um what what definition of colonization is is best for what happens in this game, uh, since there don't seem to be indigenous um inhabitants, human ones at least, um. So a, a lot of uh common ideas about colonization i guess don't necessarily apply there's also the fact of it just having a, a colonization aesthetic like uh, it, it yeah. really really uh, dips in people's ideas of what what colonies look like with the with the uh, way the forts look with the clothing people wear um it obviously it's intentionally ahistorical and, and mix and match to dispel the discomfort of colonization, but at the same time, I feel it really taps into the the, the thrill of of the colonial imagination. Yeah, oh, that's a really good way of phrasing it. I like that. Right, the idea that it is something thrilling. Right, the idea of going forth into the frontier, where there are not people, and surviving against all odds, yeah. is a genuinely exciting thing. Especially in an Anglo-American context, where that is kind mm. of what Ideal we do. Costume. I mean, yeah. it's, what, it's what has been historically done, and is so influential in our media, in ideas of, you know, our cowboys, Etc. Although, as, as, as we both have dwelled on, w whether you view it from an environmental angle or, or one of, of, of um, racism and intercultural encounter, the empty land is a construction. It's, of course. It doesn't exist. So um, this, this very experience um, depends on a certain worldview that devalues uh, other life, whether human or not. Mm -hmm. Or as, as Microstate put it, you saying there are not people is sounds pretty creepy, <laughs> but yeah, yeah it, it sums up the, the view of, of colonizers pretty well. Exactly. Now, there is something super interesting here, continuing that thought, considering this world is inhabited by zombies who are basically unpeople. I mean, they are uh, to adopt... Uh, uh, what's her name? Um, oh, I can't remember my, my monster theorists. Oh, that's bad. Uh, anyway, the idea of ab abjection, right? The un undeath is the collapse of the subject and the object completely into the abject. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is ultimately, uh, Jeremy Cohen talks about this uh, a lot, of the idea of monster, the undead is ultimately a reflection of social values, always. Yeah because it is the Ur monster. But it ultimately doesn't really solve the problem that they're not of... that are in the first draft of the game, which got scrapped and completely reworked, uh, they were indigenous people <laughs> that were being murdered. Uh, which is... Yeah. which is true. But at the same time, there is... Wow, that's actually a really good... I, we may have... You know, the boost in armor may finally outweigh our uh fashion i'm sorry i'm so sorry yeah uh picking up on that oh, oh sorry no i do i do have more there. thoughts there of there's yeah. a really interesting counter argument here in that all of the zombies are former colonists 
Right. Yeah. It oh. is exclusively colonists that fall into abjection. But, if I may... Yes, please. Um, so, first of all, you, you already said that the undead is basically the, the original monster. It is uh, thus also the original other. Just taking the yeah. example of Bram Stoker's Dracula, you have the othering through the fact that Dracula is from a foreign, strange, primitive country. Uh, you have the the heavy queer coding mm -hmm. in Dracula. So often uh, there, there is an, an overlap, I think, between uh, implicit or explicit uh, eroticism and narratives of the um, of the undead. Um, put simply, vampires are gay. Um, so the undead are a very, very fishy choice to replace indigenous people with because they are already such a strong symbol of the subhuman. And we can tie back here to, to what we discussed earlier with the monsters expected in the Americas, the equation between the Caribs and the dog-headed um, people. So this, this view of the only inhabitants of this strange new land being inhuman monsters that it is morally a-okay to kill. That is really just, you know, taking some of the more brutal views of the conquerors and colonizers. Because they, they at times saw indigenous Americans in a way very similar to us looking at these these undead creatures here. Yes. And then what what for this dude just brought up the fact that monsters you must kill um are all former colonists. That is is not a counter argument like you depicted actually, because basically the idea of going native is the great fear of the colonizer. Because, yeah, this land is strange. It is dangerous. It is dangerous especially because it is corrupting. It is full of primitive culture. Uh -huh. And you want to, to bring it forward, to bring your superior culture here. But you're always in danger of it going the opposite way and your own culture degrading. Um, this is a phenomenon as, uh, studied in some depth over, over several books by Anne-Laura Stoller, who is one of my favorite theorists of of colonialism um who goes deep into into this this defining fear of the colonizer becoming corrupted becoming inferior themselves either th through actual um biological mixture um with with the indigenous inhabitants or through loss of of certain cultural traits um, through adaptation. So the fact that uh, the monsters you fight are your own corrupted brethren, that really, again, dips deep into the colonial imaginary. Yeah, it does. And it's, it's actually, yeah, it's still uncomfortable, even it, when they're it, undead. It, it super is. Uh, and I don't think we can actually, right, when I say that there's the interesting counter-argument, I definitely don't think it negates any of that. Like, mm -hmm. any of that theory, any of that work, especially given the fact that there is a lost indigenous, or a quote-unquote lost indigenous history that is being hinted at. Uh, oh. We saw it, oh. We should go back there as soon as I... Hmm. Where can we, where's our closest there spot to it? There are any cursed graveyards I'm going to scream. Uh, it's not a <laughs> graveyard. <laughs> Um, Seattle Circus, yeah, on, on the one hand, we, we have louder discussions about colonialism and post-colonialism today than ever before uh, with with things like the Black Lives uh, Matter movement, for example, with the big attention that um, Standing Rock protests uh, managed to garner. But at the same time, this kind of discourse always produces counter discourse and in a way 2021 is the perfect year 
to bring out a pro-colonial game. I'm not even saying this is a pro-colonial game. I think it's just a game in love with an aesthetic it doesn't necessarily critically engage with. Ha! Um, but <laughs> yeah, you will we can find a, little... a lot of people on on the far right or or just just even unconsciously sympathizing with the far right uh, who are very pro-colonialism there is still a lot of of um nostalgia for the british empire here in the uk where i'm at right now um macron in in france is having huge trouble pushing through his agenda of actually um apologizing for some of france's uh, colonial crimes Such a controversial because there's story. just yeah there's still so much nostalgia for for that period among certain subsets of the of the uh, french population so um there is still a lot of of um positive feelings towards colonialism in europe and and north america um that you can up absolutely pander to if you want to but again i'm not saying this game necessarily panders to these views i think it really just likes an aesthetic in a certain type of adventure story and it sadly does so in a fairly old-fashioned way with half-hearted attempts of, of cleaning um that image up with with the empty land and the the undead and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um. It's not good. And by the way, you said uh, it, it also, somewhat uncritically it, uh, uh, earlier when you were describing this game's attitude. We can go a little uh, bit farther by than that at this point. I'd say complete, like so disinterested, it almost rejects all attempts to uh, like call it out for it. <laughs> I also have to say, I mean, you know, I'm not that much of a gamer, and mm -hmm. I don't have that much experience with games, but it also, like, for a game in 2021, it looks kind of lame. Like, I, I had games in, like, the 2000s that kind of looked like this. I mean, in some ways, yes. In other ways, this game is genuinely alarmingly fun. Right? It, it's not right. the best, it's not the yeah, prettiest maybe, game maybe in the, the world. Me mechanics are more fun than, than I can tell right now, but the graphics are kind of lame. Exactly. It's not the prettiest game in the world. It's not the best lit game in the world. But it is actually a really well designed feedback loop that probably does get better as you actually mm -hmm. get into the higher level and the actual multiplayer aspects to it. Because this is an MMO, even though we have not to date played it. As if it was an MMO in any meaningful way. <laughs> oh, perfect. I think this is a quote-unquote ancient uh, site up here. Oh, wow. Perfect. It's, not, right. the one, it's not the one we're going to go to at the end here for me to uh, show you. But I think this is one. Assuming I can get up here by... Skyrimming, skyrimming my way up this year rock cliff. Uh... Um, but what, what Raptor says about, you know, enjoying a thing critically and, and um, not requiring it to be perfect as long as you, yeah, view it critically, that is true, but I also have uh, massive sympathy uh, for, for anyone who says I... I I want this kind of game to stop. I want I want people to, to pay attention to these issues, be sensitive, and, and not make another piece, uh, and another piece like this, um, that basically encourages the the uncritical people. So, yeah, I, I also I also really get the other side, um, that says no, I I can't enjoy this at all because of these. <laughs> these problematic things. Okay. That's... Yeah. And I'm in a weird spot, obviously, trying to be the, a communicator on this. Mm-hmm. Uh... 
because regardless of my personal enjoyment of the game, and I mean, it still does exist and matter in some way. Right, as a historian who is existing in a space trying to communicate, hopefully educate people to look more critically at their games and make these more conscious choices about what they consume and uh, what they think is worth consuming, right? I can't just say, oh, I critically enjoy this. I can say that this is fun, but I can say that that fun is incredibly weird. Mm. Because in no way, shape, or form is this sort of rampant, at the very minimum, environmentally colonialist game. Uh, going to improve historical discourse in and around games. And it actually, in a lot of ways, you know, the number of people I have seen that go, oh, this isn't actually colonialism, is just wild. Yeah, I mean, you can't call it... You can't call a game New World without, you know, kind of uh, making it colonial just by, by virtue of that name. That already invokes ideas um, that you will then have to, to address it in some way. Um, exactly. I did not hit that can, shot, it, uh, but that's okay. <laughs> You can make, um, I don't know, My Little Pony game, and you call it New World, and people are going to wonder, okay, what, what is the colonial connection here? Why, why is it called that? So, um, uh, yeah, correct. You, 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 you cannot make a game like this, and even if there are technically, technically, um, no indigenous people, that doesn't mean it's not colonialist. Exactly, which speaks a lot to just how wild popular discourse around colonialism, colonialisms, yeah. plural, is. Good because point. the number of people who go, oh, you know, the captain who is blatantly a conquistador is a bad guy, uh, the game doesn't have any indigenous peoples to exploit and genocide, therefore it's not colonialist. It's funky. And that's no shade to any of the people who have said that to me. It's just, it's something that is objectively untrue, and the fact that that is a part of the discourse is... odd. I don't really know what to make of it. It's just odd. Now let's see if we can actually get up onto the top of this cliff. Hmm. The attempts so far were inconclusive. Attempts so far were abjectly failures. <laughs> I wanted to be nice about it. <laughs> I have no such qualms. Look at how purple this mushroom is. Oh, that is a purple mushroom. That was an extremely uh, violently purple mushroom. Yeah, I love it. I love it. What? So yeah, while, while Adam deals with the cliff, anyone have in the chat have, have questions about any of the stuff uh, we've said so far or stuff you want us to say that we didn't bring up yet? Uh, any any topics we we should broach? while trying to climb a cliff and kill a wolf. Oh, that's terrible. Oh, that's terrible. Oh my goodness. So, our abilities that we have at this first level are, um... If you shoot people more, you shoot people more and more. Uh, sniping, sniping, or bear trap. And this one, which is just murder, murder people who are already dying. That sounds unethical. It, it's effective, but um, definitely as a 
Mer like, plus 10% damage if someone is already at 30% or below health. So, the, you've already done most of the hard work. Let us just finish murdering the animal. Because that was the, the two trees are Sharpshooter and Trapper. Mm. And the fact that muskets are intrinsically associated with fur trapping... Yeah. Is a choice. That's obviously... Um... American frontier That's colonialism. The... It's American frontier colonials. True, we have not even gone into the factions yet, I see. We will have to do that at some point, too. Uh, also, what specific environment is this new world based on? It isn't. That's uh, a good question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's. <laughs> Put most simply, it is uh, a amalgamation of a, a dozen different real world environments across North America, Southeast Asia, South Central America. Uh, so, uh, yeah, thus far we haven't seen anywhere that is obviously Euro, but we've also seen some places that are like plausibly Euro-inspired, but yes, I think anywhere but Europe is probably a mostly <laughs> fair, mostly fair interpretation. So, uh, indigenous presence in Aeternum. Take a look at it. Cool. So the statues, the statues. are kind of Egyptian? That, that's what everyone else's thought is, too, but something feels real funky about that idea to me. And I don't know what it is. I don't know. I guess part of it is like the the headgear and the the kilt and the. Oh well, that's bad. I just whiffed that. Toes, I guess. Although, does it have multiple arms? It does have four arms. I mean, huh. most most statues have multiple arms, and that multiple is two. But this one has four. Ow. Nay, hey, switch to the rapier. Yeah, you, you, you kill that guy, then I can take a this look. Exactly. That's my goal here. Uh, got him. Unfortunately, this area is somewhat too high level for us, so we will need to be careful. Because when he All respawns, right. he will wreck us. So we have a limited amount of time here. All but... Right. Oh shit, there's two more. Uh... Because now that sounds kind of Greek. Um... Yeah, this, this is all over the place. Isn't it? Yeah, like the... The cool. stones almost, almost give me like a slight Inca vibe. My um, thought too. They're actually, uh, actually, but... you're right. That's the bit I've been missing. Uh, they're mortarless. The entire construction is mortarless. Mm, which is what, point. which is what's been triggering. I think that's what's been triggering the Inca vibe so much for me. Is that yeah. it's a mortarless construction made out of dark stone. And how mm, is that yeah. anything other than Inca? Uh, but the statues then are like a weird love child of of Egypt and and India, and Ugh, they're retreating. Boo! I carried them too far. Let's get down here. Maybe they won't aggro on me. Sneak. Because if we can walk around the edge here, we can see the stones in more detail. Yeah, look mm -hmm. at this. Look at these cut stones. 
Yeah, but it's it's not really Inca either because no, it's the not. Inca have have like that Lego principle where they they have the stones fit together. So it's mm -hmm. right. It you anything you... like North America either. It's just it's a mess. You, you do get this very vague sense of it out of these two stones, but for the most part, you're right. These are not, like, cut to have weird corners so that they slot together. These are just conveniently shaped giant bricks. Mm. We're sneaky. Ah, boo, and I can't, I can't zoom out when I'm... Oh, yes, I can. There we go. Now we're zoomed out so we can get a better look at it. Well then, look at this place. Yeah. Now, now I'm getting somewhat more Indian vibes from, from some of the statues than before. Mm -hmm. But... This is, again, just really, really... Yeah, everything that's not Europe, basically. <laughs> exactly, right. Which, I'm... which is in itself so reductive. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm um. Yeah, I guess maybe maybe it would have been better if they had, had the guts to just just go for it. You know. Actually, actually do like a fantasy version of of. The, the Americas and, and let us engage with that and maybe grapple with the moral implications or something. <laughs> it's Am it's Amazon. What moral? Oh uh, right, yeah, yeah. No, I do definitely not want Amazon to grapple grapple with any moral implications. I I think that would mm -hmm. severely um uh, okay. severely go wrong. Exactly. Like, they look so... They're so hard to pin down. And right... Which I guess is, is good because it at least... I mean... At least it's it's not... Fair. Yeah. A good, good oh. job combining, like, 15 different layers of things that we could classify as indigeneity into an entity that looks like none of them and all of them at the same time. Mm. <laughs> but also... Like, everything we've thrown out is in some level either due to distance in the past or actual histories of colonization have an argument to be marked as indigenous. And it makes me so distressed. Honestly, it's just distressing. Oh, by the way, OSP YouTube. Blue, welcome. Didn't see you slip in there. Statues look suspiciously like Darth Nihilus. Well, that's <laughs> hilarious. God. What a video game. What a video game we have picked here. And there is so much left to do. There is so many things left. For great suffering. <laughs> like I don't know. Have you have you seen the factions at all? Ah, uh, I know you explained them somewhat in one of your past streams, but like exactly. I said, I only caught fragments. Fair. Uh, so the factions are uh basically the dominant political structures. They are not. The settlements have independent governance, as the settlements are basically city-states, but are then ruled by a guild super superstructure. So I guess most comparable to like the Hanseatic League, historically. Hmm. Except the three factions uh, of these larger structures are known as the Covenant, which are these paladins of goodness who think that they are, through faith, they are going to deal with the corruption and save Eternum. In other words, they're 19th century American Protestants. <laughs> uh, and then there is the Marauders, who are this noble martial warrior culture who thinks science and faith 
are dumb and bullshit and we should just focus on ability to punch people. In other words, uh, pop cultural pirates. E e no, without no, boats. Even pirates. That's, that sounds like Spartans in pop culture. That 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 like pop culture Spar Spartan pirate people without boats. Yeah. And then there is the one that we are a part of, the Syndicate. And that the Syndicate sounds threatening. Is not a crime ring. It is instead a whole bunch of scientists who think ethics committees are for cowards and fools. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god, that's just so... That's, that's think honestly that... like a, a third grader on 4chan drawing a political compass. Yup. That's, that's just so... There's really no... No, no depth to it, is there? No, there's truly none. It is the most American Protestant idea of religion, the most 21st century American Protestant idea of rationality and scientific inquiry, and pirates. Wow. It is so comically unsubtle that I wow. truly have no words for it. <sighs> It's, it's just so sad with with how much effort some some other media put into their fantasy cultures. Yeah, no, this is um, just this is just Euro colonialism as made by American pro by American Protestant backgrounds. Blues, it's too late. We have already joined the the anti ethics committees. Ethics committees are for chumps and cowards and buffoons, and we shall believe that for at least the next three months. Mm -hmm. I, I can see why the history communicator joined this. Also, I don't know how we're overloading these cartridges with gunpowder for our ability, just for the record. That is an ability, and I'm not sure why it's an ability, or how that works. <laughs> yeah, high-speed breech-loading muskets that you can arbitrarily change the amount of powder in the cartridge for. I, I mean, I'm not a weapons expert, but wouldn't that just make the thing explode in your face? Yes. Yeah, alright, alright. Extremely high but... chance of exploding in your face. Fate. Explosion is your special ability. Got it. Dang it. Boom. Ah, I whiffed that. That was bad. What? Ugh. Aim. What is aim? Oh, you didn't die. And then I missed. What? Musket mastery. Okay. More sharpshooter. Ha! <laughs> Crossbows don't exist in this game. I really don't know my weapons history. When did crossbows fall out of use? Later, uh, I mean, they're pretty well out of use by the 18th century, but they're well All in right. use in the uh, you know, 16th century. Alright, yeah, I... I don't know my Do weapons I get credit history. for that? I get credit for one of those, at least. Retreating to safety. We are abandoning this place, perfect as it is, for betrayal is in the air. Our three families. Okay, a couple of keys. A couple of keys. That's where we're going. Also, you've got a life staff, so you're healing, which is awesome. Where are we going? Uh, this way. Hmm. 
thought that wasn't dead. I didn't hit. That's bad. And load that in. I am not a very good shot here. I must. I must <laughs> confess. And I'm going through bullets at a frankly alarming rate. <laughs> Luckily, they're I cheap. You, they're like, yeah, I guess you're really living the the musket experience there. Exactly. They're like five gold for a hundred bullets. So. And none of them hit. <laughs> I can't. I can't hit worth a damn. But that's fine. What? That's fine. Re repeating. Cr oh yeah, there was a comment on like repeating crossbows, uh, or like high level herbalists. Yeah, unfortunately, they actually kind of suck, cause. You can't. You have to put way less tension in the string, or way less weight on the bow limbs, in order to be able to pull it back quickly enough to reload it. So they actually don't have all that much penetration power. It's depressing. They would be so cool otherwise. Also, by the way, another another weird thing uh, in this game. Supposedly, for strange and bizarre reasons in the lore, uh, to justify gameplay mechanics, uh, all domesticated animals went feral and have become untamable. Uh, the m pretty much just after landing in. That's. probably bad. Hmm. So is is the lad good or is the lad bad? Does it make people immortal or does it make them corrupt? Yes. Oh, all right. The answer is both of those things. And the thing that they're trying to deal with is trying to, you know, respond to that and go, well, how do we get rid of this corruption part so it is just good? So it is just good, happy, fun time stuff. So taming the land. Extremely. Yeah. By the power of shooting cats in the face. This is just long range petting, by the way. If anyone is curious, this is a hun this is long range petting, and is in no way, shape, or form bad. <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to accept that I am murdering giant cats. Also, these are enormous pumas. I'm sorry, these are... These are gargantuan North American mountain lions. But yeah, for some strange reason, uh... Like, all sheep and horses went... Uh just became completely wild, uh, lost all control, and you cannot retain them. So therefore, all carts are carried by hand. And also, if you go into a boat for too far, you'll, a storm will spring up out of nowhere to sink you, and that's why there are all those shipwrecks. Okay. And therefore, there is no boats, and there are no horses, and you just kind of vibe. Does that make any sense? No, but... Not really, no. Is it what they're going for? Yep. Like... I mean... That, that sounds more set up for, for like a hunter-gatherer themed... thing. Post-apocalyptic... You know, caveman core. Yes, cows do appear to be... Uh, you are correct, Eldritch Horror. Uh, cows do seem to be exempt from this for reasons. Are you are you punching me with your pistol? Oh. 
This person is punching me with a pistol. Wow, I just missed. What the fuck? <laughs> Attack me. I believe in you. Got it. Got it. <laughs> okay, so we are just like going to random places. This is apparently a very pirate area. Because it says they're buccaneers, and therefore everyone involved is clearly mm -hmm. a buccaneer. That's how that works. What? Hmm. Fair enough. No time to... Uh... Turns out just spamming the attack button against people with shields is the only effective thing. Also, bullets apparently don't go through steering wheels, is the lesson I have taken away from this <laughs> uh, lesson. Right, ships, wheels, block bullets. The more you know. And another turkey. God, the the problem. Is, I mean, I could do an entire like article just on the proliferation of turkeys in this video game. To go on. Right. Uh, there is no animal that is more closely associated with the ideas of Americana and American frontierism, especially uh, in the Eastern United States, than the wild turkey. All right. Right. Uh, it's to the point where even someone like, you know, Ben Franklin goes, "Oh yeah, the turkey, being this uniquely and deeply American animal, should actually be the national the national bird and not the bald eagle." That would have made for funnier United States. It would have been very funny. Um. All right. Yeah. I mean, I I know it's it's a deeply um American symbol. I wouldn't have uh, associated it with the frontier in uh, in particular because I I in, in in my mind it's it's associated more with like urbanized areas, uh, or urbanized is maybe the wrong word. More um, you know, uh, long time settled areas um. Rather than the frontier, which, which, like when I hear the word, I think of of something uh, that is more more loosely settled, um, that may even um, uh, be be defined by an encounter with with nomadic um, peoples. Whereas the the turkey, I, I I think of yeah of of town life. Interesting. That that might just because my. My turkeys are, of course, in in Mesoamerica, which which is a very urban culture. So maybe that's just where I get the the turkey association from. <laughs> yeah, that's that's reasonable. Uh, uh, there's no point in me blocking the. I need to remember that there's no point in me trying to block the people with guns because it turns out, guns. <laughs> Ships wheels may block guns, but uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt, rapiers do not. Yeah, I mean, turkeys have like a totally different set of connotations. Right, I know very little about turkeys in Mesoamerica, so if you want to elaborate mm -hmm. on that, I'd be happy to hear it. Uh, but, right, my idea with it as a colonial entity, uh, 
is to a large part right the idea of it is out in in the woods right that turkeys mm -hmm. are going to be in this dense ancient forest land and that you might build a settlement in but it's definitely a coexistence with the frontier and the forest land mm -hmm. and that it is this discovered thing that settlers go into and one of the first big things they find is of course turkeys this gigantic bird mm -hmm. this frankly enormous bird that just is around and so it's i mean there's a reason why turkey is a thanksgiving thing right well between mm -hmm. turkeys and thanksgiving it just wraps up wraps itself up in such a specific like design and environment of pilgrim pilgrims right. which is I, a I pilgrimage always... as its own entity associated with american always... sandwich yes. is wild <laughs> knowing knowing mesoamerica better than north america or well cultural north america geographically of course mesoamerica is part of of North America. I always guessed the, the Thanksgiving thing was really just because the turkey was such a staple food and, and such a just symbol of, you know, eating. We have food, we have a turkey. So yeah, in, in Mesoamerica, turkey is, is really a staple food. It's turkeys and dogs are like the the meats that a commoner may have access to on, on a good day. Um, deer and so on are often a uh, subject to sumptuary laws, so uh, even if uh, a commoner might have got his hands on deer meat, he would not technically be allowed to eat it. Um, but turkeys also have, I mean, they, they, are, they are, like I said, large and kind of scary, so they do definitely also have ambiguous, um, associations in Mesoamerica, um, there, there is a, a deity of, of sickness and bad luck uh, with with the Mexica, with the Aztecs, um, that, that is um, a jade-covered turkey, so it's Turchu Tudotlin, um, um, the, the jade turkey. Which is a form of the what highly incredible. ambiguous deity, um, Tezcatlipoca, and, and is a, a deity of, of sickness and bad luck. I did so, not realize uh, that he was a turkey. That is incredible. Among Tezcatlipoca has many, many faces. So um, he can appear as a skunk too. That, yeah, that would make more with, sense. Again, sickness, <laughs> bad smells. He can appear as a coyote, he can appear as a turkey, he can appear as a jaguar, as, as the god of, of the nobility and of um, of, of um, nobility's power, um, strongly associated with the, with the jaguar, but also with, with many other animals, many of which that have ambiguous or even just outright negative association. Oh, oh, the the sumptuary laws that's talking about pre-colonial Mesoamerica, um, settled circus. So the Spanish, um, I'm not actually sure about sumptuary laws on food in colonial Spanish America. I know they had a lot of sumptuary laws on clothing and on weapons. Um, so. Usually non-white people were not allowed to carry weapons unless they, they um, had gotten a special honor. Usually the indigenous nobility was allowed to, to ride horses and carry weapons. I don't know about sumptuary laws for foods. As far as I know, sumptuary laws for foods, and at least in Europe also for fabrics, really start breaking down uh, in the, the early modern period um, because all these new materials from the from the colonies start coming in and there's just no frame of reference for them like sure you have sumptuary laws on stuff like silk let's say but what about cotton what about chocolate 
there's just no frame of reference within the traditional um the uh, traditional jurisprudence of sumptuary laws for these new materials so in europe uh, the, the whole sumptuary thing begins to slowly it's definitely th still a big thing in the 16th century but begins to slowly slowly crumble amazing um, but in the colonies yes sumptuary laws are mostly a racial tool because in the um in the spanish colonies really the the conquistadores m managed to establish um a, a culture in which being being spanish being white ultimately automatically um makes you a noble within the colonial arena so in in the colonies all spaniards are hidalgos are um are nobles um so the the whole um social pyramid of, of nobility and peasants and so on becomes completely racialized with everyone white or European being automatically nobility and everyone who is indigenous or, or uh, black or mixed race being being peasants in, in that logic. Um, so uh, the, the whole sumptuary thing works very different in the colonies than in in the European homeland. Yeah, the, the, the sumptuary laws I talked about before, Seattle Circus, about what meat you're allowed to eat, for example, um, those, those were pre-colonial ones I was referring to, but the Europeans definitely also have their own sumptuary laws. Of the kind I just discussed, for example, who is allowed to ride a horse, who is allowed to uh, carry weapons, who is allowed to wear certain clothing, that was a big thing especially um free black and a mixed race people um white elites constantly complained about the ostentatious clothing that free black people allegedly um wore and there were repeated attempts to change that whether whether they actually wore that that ostentatious clothing or whether that was just you know a racist myth I would I would have to to study that myself. I'm I'm not sure about that. That's just something I read about, not something I necessarily have expertise mm -hmm. on. But yeah, you, just knowing that there's complaints about about free black people wearing ostentatious clothing that obviously sounds suspicious. So I would have to look into that if we have anything like for example a trial where the exact clothing someone wore is recorded otherwise I, I cannot say if there was actually like a culture of, of of consciously breaking breaking these rules among black people i can't say that mm -hmm. both are possible i like on the spot right now i don't know reasonable yeah, but in general, the, the colonies, and especially the frontiers of the colonies, are spaces where, yeah, what we talked about earlier, this breakdown of European culture that everyone is afraid of, definitely happens. Because sometimes you just need to use uh, indigenous clothing to deal with a certain environment, or use indigenous technologies, and that, of course, makes... Um, makes colonial elites uncomfortable especially the, the french with their um, uh, um with their trappers and and all these these um foresteers uh they worry about that a lot that their people are becoming too too um american rather than the other way around um with with the Spanish, I think going native in in air quotes is less of a problem, because they just um really really are uh, incentivize being being not just ethnically but culturally Spanish, because li like I said, being being Spanish or white 
automatically uh, confers huge privileges on you. So there's there's less incentive to, um, or, or rather, like I said, often the environment is an incentive to go native in certain regards. But there's there's a strong counter incentive in the enormous privileges the colonial state will confer uh, on on those it deems culturally appropriate. Um. Yeah, the barbarism of pants um, is, is is a good good comparison. Um, there's there's huge uh, paranoia attached to things like indigenous clothing, or indeed even uh, indigenous foods. There there's a very good book written about that. Um, about the the worries that uh, for eating things like like corn. Or potatoes was ruining Europeans' bodies. Um, to to eat like like a savage was to become a savage. So yeah, there there were huge um fears attached to things we today would consider completely irrelevant because today it is to to a certain degree the other way around. Europeans uh, or or Westerners more broadly desire. Uh, the trappings of other cultures and and commit cultural appropriation um because because they they find or let's, let's not get into the the complex um reasonings behind cultural appropriation there are loads of reasons but the point is today we we have a problem with with people wanting to uh, adopt cultural practices that are not theirs to adopt and then there was a a huge fear uh, attached to that, and, and Europeans tried to prevent their fellow Europeans mm -hmm. from adopting other cultural practices. In because, some ways... Yeah. Yeah? No, sorry. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, that actually seems... Well... Perhaps it's an overstatement to say comparable, but at least resonant with... Uh, so, oh, I'm still encumbered. God damn it. Uh, sorry, I got distracted by the needs of not getting myself into a lot of trouble with my equip load. Uh, anyway, it feels resonant to ideas uh, of this sort of desire, right? The taboo is a declaration of desire as much as it is of forbiddance. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, something it needs to be forbidden because it is something people want to do. And so I, the I'm not sure I entirely agree. Like, it, it really depends on the individual context. We Fair. definitely have uh, situations where things are forbidden that never happened, that nev no one would even have thought of doing, uh, just, just for ideological reasons. They are basically fictional crimes constructed out of out of ideology so that happens too I, I wouldn't agree that uh, a prohibition is always an indication of of something actually happening that's but, yeah, on on a on a more abstract level i guess it it can be it can be a an um, expression of desire i wouldn't say it always is that's that's reasonable. I over definitely overstated my case a little bit there. Also, look at the size of this freaking alligator. Damn, that that belongs in the Cretaceous. At the very least. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, even Australia would be shook to see that. Yeah. Um, I feel like I still wanted to say something. I know, I, back, I, I got... Back in that attic when we both spoke up at the, at the same time. Um, yeah, I had, had a more coherent thought and then I had immediately forgot it, so... <laughs> um, Such is the video game life. <laughs> talking about cultural adaptation and how it's scary and bad. 
Uh huh. Within. Oh yeah. Um. I guess. I guess in a way that also shows something we we haven't really talked about a lot since the beginning. The the importance of Christianity to the whole endeavor of yeah. uh, colonization or European colonization, of course. Um. So something that is easy to forget from our modern post-enlightenment perspective where we consider religion like a, a enclosed box within culture all of culture in the early modern period was religious and all all religion related to culture in some way so obviously what this is ultimately about is all aspects of indigenous pre-colonial culture are viewed as expressions of paganism and so um even something like indigenous clothing is a threat to a uh, european's own uh, christianity um so because religion penetrates all of culture that deeply uh, european culture is seen as christian culture in fact in the conquest period, the Spanish didn't call themselves, usually in, in their accounts, they don't call themselves Españoles, they don't call themselves Blancos, they call themselves Cristianos. Yes. The, the distinction is between Christians and others. So their, their culture with all parts of it, food, clothing, habits, dances, whatever, all of that is seen as extensions of the Christian faith, and thus everything that differs from it is a dangerous expression of paganism. So, indigenous people need to adapt more than just Christian rituals. They, they need to adopt uh, European clothing and, and um, everyday habits, and um, on the reverse, um, Europeans who adopt any any kind of um, indigenous culture are in danger of of becoming heretics or apostates or pagans or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, a huge a huge part of the program of, for example, Jesuit missions um, is is stuff like um european um european uh, dress european food uh european um crafts um ways ways of working things like that so um Yeah, that, that is seen as just as important as, as communion or um, any any other kind of, of Christian ritual to the Christianization um, of, of indigenous people. Less so, less so the abducted Africans. That, that is also something to remember. Um, they just don't matter that much. So, in fact, even even the Spanish, who rely so heavily on uh, Christianization and on Catholic doctrine for the um, justification of their colonial endeavor, um, they don't really pay that much attention to Christianizing the enslaved people they claim to own um, properly. So you have. Um, very few missionaries care to, to record that, to engage with um, with enslaved people. They are fully occupied with indigenous people. And um, so you, you have the few that do record it. They, they speak of um, enslaved Africans only converting on, on their deathbed or not at all, because there, there is no... Um, really uh, organized way for for christianizing the enslaved um so that really also says to to turn this around says something about the hierarchization of humanity there the the in 
indigenous people, for better or worse, enormous effort and resources are poured into Christianizing them. No such thing for for enslaved people, usually. So that, that really says something about the different evaluation of them as humans. Ow. <laughs> Sorry, I, I talked all, all over your dramatic fight. That's all right. Um, <laughs> My fight was not, was actually, you know, I will give myself credit there. That was actually somewhat dramatic for a change. I was going to say it wasn't that dramatic, but that wasn't true. It was extremely dramatic. I, I actually, it's it's a bit of a disagreement um, within our scholarship of racism or like proto-racism, as I prefer to call it. I, I personally, in, in my scholarship, have have forwarded the opinion that there or joined joined the faction that says that there isn't really you can't really call it racism before the 18th century because um a huge element of what we today consider racism is the idea that the um inferiority of certain races is hereditary is mm -hmm. biological and you don't really have that system of like scientific classification before the 18th century so i usually speak of proto-racism for the um derogatory attitudes towards people who are perceived as different because of their skin color or other features uh, before the 18th century but anyway yeah there there's basically a lot of discussion about whether um Indigenous American peoples are seen as superior to uh, black people or whether black people are seen as superior to indigenous American people by um, the mostly the Spanish that's that's where I know the um no proto racism is is kind of a good term actually Seattle Circus because this idea of it being inherited starts um, creeping in gradually since the 15th century. Um, it, it doesn't just appear suddenly in the, in the 18th century. 18th century is just where it really becomes solidified into this scientific um, or pseudo-scientific um, way of thinking. But you basically have the idea of... of um, racial inferiority being hereditary since the 15th century um, with the um, blood purity statutes in Spain where um, so be before that our Jewish people could claim the full privileges of Christian society by converting to Christianity but after uh, after a lot of forced conversions of Jewish people to Christianity in Iberia at the end of the 14th century, um, Christian elites were growing kind of nervous because suddenly there were a lot more Christian people, many of them with with considerable education and resources uh, that suddenly had claim to to many of the same privileges as them. So uh, they start developing these, this new ideology of blood purity that um, Christians of Jewish descent are, are inherently untrustworthy, are inherently inferior, and that, that keeps being developed over time. And by, by the 16th century, for, for many officers, including, um, including Anything to do with university, you cannot study at university if you have Jewish ancestors. You have to show a certificate of of uh, blood purity or or a family tree proving uh, you don't have Jewish ancestors. So that that starts creeping in over time. Uh, so yeah, I do think proto racism is a good term to use from the 15th century onwards, as this idea of hereditary uh, inferiority starts creeping in gradually 
But yeah, my, my actual point is, yeah, there's there's a lot of contradiction ultimately in the proto-racist um, ideology about, yeah, whether whether um, Africans are completely subhuman, um, whether they are actually um, superior to indigenous Americans, and if so, why it is still A-OK -okay to enslave them. Uh, and not to enslave indigenous Americans. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of contradictions there. So depending on what aspect of that attitude you um, you study, uh, different scholars have constructed different pyramids or, or different layers in the pyramid of which which race was socially treated as superior and inferior. Um, so in in my study of um, of masculinity, um, yeah, you, you could say I guess that that black people are are superior to indigenous Americans in in that view because they are seen as more masculine um, than um, than Native Americans. Although an interesting point about um, 16th century views of masculinity is being more masculine and more lustful and vigorous does not necessarily mean being straight because um, sodomy, the unspeakable sin against nature, against God, blah, 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 gay stuff, um, is seen as the highest, the worst sin of lust. So actually being hyper-masculine and thus hyper-lustful doesn't automatically um, translate to being hyper-heterosexual. Um, the uh, Arabs and Turks are seen as, as hyper-sexual, as, as hyper-masculine in many ways. They they are said to have huge penises, for example, um, mm -hmm. by the by the Spanish. Um, yet they are notorious sodomites, because once you are super lustful, it doesn't really matter to you anymore whether you are um, doing lustful things with women or men. Um, so these these different hierarchies. Of, of sinfulness, of masculinity, of all the, the the different things society values or devalues, they interact in different and sometimes contradictory ways with this uh, category of of race. Mm -hmm. So race can be super sinful, which is bad, but also super masculine, which is good. And ultimately, yeah, I, I have in, in a paper, I have contended that you kind of need a multi-axis coordinate system to to uh, track that. You, you need one axis for for uh, gender presentation and one, one axis for physical sex and one axis for sexual orientation and, and one axis for, for intelligence and one and all of these together somehow track race or, or social yeah. status and so on. So it's really, really complex and, and it doesn't fully run parallel these different ways of hierarchizing humanity. Uh-huh. Uh, that is at least five different axes like you just mentioned. Graphing that would be a, yeah. a pain. Yeah, which which is why I'm I'm not a big fan actually of like you know quantitative analysis and and forcing everything into a graph. Agreed. Um, so sometimes hum humans are um just a bit too complex for that. Yeah, yeah. We don't need to play six dimensional chess every time we want to like think about a person. Yeah. Oh, look at that image. That image was so... Mm, so 
informative in the worst way. <laughs> yeah. Right, like, what are you supposed to do about that apart from, oh, wow, look, undead are literally subhuman, wolves are also there, so it is the brave solo person with them and their gun going forth. I mean, um, Emmett, because because you say the people you study made their own graphs about who's better than who, uh, early modern Europeans definitely did that too. They they had, um, especially the Spanish by the 18th century have these these so-called casta paintings that kind of uh, show all the different kinds of of a racial mixture are uh, recognized within colonial society and, and put them. In a kind of of descending order, and there there are the um, the tables of nations that that kind of depict all the different ethnic groups or, or nations or whatever you're going to call them, um, and also hierarchize them. So they they are definitely um, artistic endeavors at graphically depicting the racial order of society or even the world um but yeah these these ultimately end up being contradictory Thank again goodness, because it's return. just that's that's a fun thing um for me about early modern like colonialism or early modern global history it's really um you, you see a world in over its over its head it's it's be, everything is becoming too complex for people to handle um and i don't know i can really really like feel everyone involved being overwhelmed by just this intercultural encounter europeans are overwhelmed by by things they cannot explain with their traditional frame of reference and and indigenous americans are just as overwhelmed um so so yeah that's that's one of the things that fascinates me about this very victorian outfit i guess um so yeah weird period smash there just that outfit looks vaguely 19th century right so. it's like fat it's it's so good there's so much to talk about with this because of course if you dig into this this is certainly like you could make an argument that there's like elite women's riding garb from the 19th century that looks like this mm. but for the most part right clearly masculine coated clothing but it ends up really what it is is it's 21st century steampunk fantasy victorianism in a fantasy like early modernist setting mm. so we're stacking we're stacking fantasy is or fantasy time periods on top of each other on just increasing layers of what the heck is going on it's so good it's so very good um also we got so a new thing didn't we Seattle Circus raises the valid question, why did uh, European colonizers even feel the need to justify themselves? And um, there's, I see several reasons there. First of all, like I said, early modern society was inseparable from religion. So there's just, there's God to account for. There, there are moral imperatives and uh, your, your peers, whether that, that is uh, your, your, just your, your individual fellow Christians or whether it is on an, on an international stage, uh, a, a rival state using your crimes against Christianity or humanity or whatever as, a, uh, as an excuse to, to attack you. Um, you, there, there is like um, moral judgment on your behavior, and on on another and maybe related level, there's just the fact that, especially 16th century, the early colonialism that especially that primarily happened with the, the Spanish and the Portuguese, 
it's it's kind of a mess it's not 19th century the the government gives them mandate to take over some some place it's some adventurer uh, with with his uh bunch of bodies um yeah in invading a place overthrowing the government there and then uh saying to the king hey we did all of this in your name now please pay us for it so um there, there is an immense immense pressure to justify your behavior because ultimately it's not about the conquest itself um it's it's not about grabbing grabbing gold or something the gold isn't for you the gold is for the king you you grab stuff to send to the king and and say hey look i i did all of this in the name of the country in the name of the crown in the name of the faith can i please have a reward because the rewards the king can give out land grants titles they are forever gold gold so to say uh gold is just for christmas um <laughs> a, a, a title or a grant of land is not just for life it can be for generations you can you can take care of descendants of yours you will never meet um so that is what what ultimately motivates most conquistadores um not not uh, grabbing some nice gold statue to to um swap in at the tavern uh that's pirates uh pirates are are much more short term oriented um but the, that the conquistadores hurt, they but... they are really after land grants and titles columbus before he goes on his voyage he makes a a contract uh, with um, the king and queen of Spain, uh, in which it is outlined that for for the trade he hopes to establish with um, Asia, he will be rewarded with um, a title that is uh, hereditary, with lands that are hereditary, and so on. So from the very first moment of this onwards. Um, uh, this is what colonization is about on the on the individual level of individual conquests done by individual conquerors. So that is why they have to justify themselves. Mm -hmm. but of course, the, the king can just re reject their uh, claims to or or uh, demand for targets and say, um, "You you." You did horrible things there. You acted against the royal interest or against the interest of the faith. Um, so that that is what a lot of the debate is about. Where was the conquest justified, and do the conquerors deserve to be rewarded or punished? Mm-hmm. Not that cinnamon dill. Uh... Yeah, I mean, there are definitely cases where I think we can safely say that there is seen as benefit to be getting the fat paycheck uh, by stealing stuff, but I agree with you that it's by no means the primary, like, thing that's going on. Not, not in the early Spanish uh, colonialism and conquest. Um, like I said, it's a it's a motivation for um, for pirates definitely because um, yeah, of course, if you manage to like plunder the Spanish treasure fleet that that um, carries all the colonial tribute from the Americas back to Spain once a year, yeah, you're you're set for life. Uh, imagine being Francis Drake and dealing that. that. What? Um, <laughs> but usually you um you you manage to um gain resources that are just a more short term benefit mm -hmm. um and then you have um 
the way 17th century Dutch and English and to a lesser degree French colonization is organized is very different because it's it ultimately has relatively little um, relation to central government. It's organized on a company level and it's yeah this this is early capitalism already so it's about investors and pleasing investors and, and yep. making a profit for investors um this this is a very very different approach and thus you actually have a lot less moral discussion um in the protestant sphere of the 17th century um, because yeah, the, the profit is is what matters, mm -hmm. and not whether what you did was was right or wrong. But that's very different from the the enormously enormously moral Catholic perspective of the 16th century Spanish conquests. Fair. Enormously moral and enormously immoral. That's not what I said. What? <laughs> That's no. no I, I right. don't want to say good moralistic Spanish no, no. and and bad no, capitalist. No, uh, that um, that was my exact joke. Right? Is that it, yeah. they framed everything in explicitly moral terms to justify the fact that they were doing horrible things. Like on any almost a. As far as there is an objective standard, and I think in the case of mm. colonialism, we can pretty much say. We can use an objective standard here. Yeah. As a rule of thumb in history, assume that everyone uh, involved is horrible. Of course, exceptions apply. And you, you find wonderful people in, in history. But usually, when, it, when it's like the, the big political stages, the stuff that actually is preserved, it's usually everyone involved was some kind of horrible. I mean... I think that the, the the Spanish conquest of the the Inca Empire or of the uh, Triple Alliance Empire in Mesoamerica horrible and criminal. That doesn't mean that these empires were nice. They were empires, which means they ran on, on exploitation yeah. and oppression. Of yeah, course. Uh, uh, um, that, mm -hmm. that doesn't that doesn't make violently taking them over a cool thing. Correct. Yeah, there was a paper at the Ask Historians Digital Conference uh, last year, which is, by the way, going on again this week, uh, that was from the perspective of, you know, someone who is a descendant of one of the cultures that the Inca obliterated in their expansion. Mm. And, yeah. like, Western Argentina, what is now Argentina. Right? Yep. Yeah. The Inca just obliterated them with horrifying brutality and enslavement. Mm -hmm. the, the Inca, I mean, not really my strongest suit, to, to be honest. I've, mm -hmm. I know much more about pre-colonial Mesoamerica, but yeah, I think it's the basic given with the with the Inca that um, they were really fabulously brutal in, basically genocidal in their conquests because they they um, forcibly transported uh, ethnic groups out of their uh, homeland, uh, split up uh, ethnic groups and, and communities to make them lose their identity. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was colonial too. That was... Um, the, the Inca Empire was, I think, uh, can be called colonial as well in, in some respects. Um, but in part, of course, that is also me uh, not doing the the intricacies there as well as with Mesoamerica. I could I could tell a way more sympathetic story exactly. of Mesoamerica than of the Inca Empire simply because I know more, Same. which I guess is is really just um a big out big big old shout out to to the, the importance of learning to to develop empathy. If, if you see no other use in history, uh, it's about empathy for, for people who are fundamentally alien. Oh, great. I think there's lots of other uses for history, but I, I, I feel like this is the really fundamental one that, that everyone can, can adopt. 
I I very much agree. So we're we're about to fight another guy here that I want to get your opinion on because um. Oh damn it! I didn't do the thing. Uh, I f always forget I need to actually like commit the points. Like, what's this guy wearing? This fath fathomless I'm, I'm syllogist. I'm not seeing him very well yet. It. It looks. I don't know. I guess you'll have to start fighting him for me to see it properly. Oh yeah, what the? I mean the um. The, the sideways thing, I mean, that's that's always something that looks slightly Inca, I guess, because of those those headdresses you see in some statues. Exactly. Um, but yeah, it's, again, it, it also has some Near Eastern vibes, I feel. What um, are these wings on his back? The place again. He has wings on his back. Is, are those wings, or is it... No, it's more like a crescent. It's no, like it's a wings, weird... you're right. Again, it, it has some pop Egypt vibes. Like, the, 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 that, those kind of wings that are not... Obviously not actual in an Egyptian art convention, but you, you see them. Yeah, yeah, for oh, this dude, that's, that's what I meant. Like, vaguely ancient Near East as well. It, it has some, like... Pop Egypt uh, aesthetic, really weird. It's extremely weird, uh, right? And also, that guy's helmet—it's worth noting—is split, which means, in other words, uh, in some way related to the giant statues that we saw mm -hmm. earlier. Also, the other thing that stands out to me is these guys is like weird, like they still have hair on these skulls, on their sides, and I'm like. Is this a reference to something, or is this just stringy? Because it can be. Um, I don't know. Huh. Yeah, no, but really, the the stuff, especially here in these ruins, it doesn't look like like anything really. Um, I'm confused. I'm as confused as you are. Oh, good. Glad for that. It means I'm not alone. <laughs> uh huh. Let's get all one of those. Oh, great! I can drop an AOE on this guy. Ow. That your science? What? <laughs> yeah, this this really feels like a background mook from the mummy movies with Brandon Fraser. That's what it reminds me of hard, most. Hard agree. He's he almost dunked on me. Almost. And of course, it fades too quickly for us to actually see a single bloody thing about him. Mm -hmm. I wish the corpse is stuck around for just a little bit longer so I could get a good image. Why don't they have legs? Is, is this supposed to be some kind of theme, or...? It's just that some of these guys have lost their legs over time. You know... I don't know, I mean, if sometimes you're skilled in headless, you, you could say this This is like... some human sacrifice thing, ritual beheadings, whatever. You would have a theme, a cultural whatever. But That'd they, be not darn... having legs, that feels just weird. No, it's... I think it's just that before... Right before they turned undead, the bodies dis became disintegrated. I think that's all it, all it's supposed to be. It's just... Yeah, I, I didn't know, I just see... 
I see another missed chance to have like some proper world building. I agree. I an ancient rapier. You love to see it. That's kind of an oxymoron. You'd think, but No, don't don't kill this guy. No, sir. I If you kill him, I don't get the thing for it. Honestly. <laughs> I think that's the point. Oh, what are you? You are. Oh, oh no. Oh, child. He is level 7 in a level 16 area? And that, as it turns yeah, out. Yeah, they should have something like bouncers outside. Ha! <laughs> I think these guys are the bouncers. They'll, they'll like, take out three quarters of your health and then yeah. you go. <laughs> I, th I thought they were the party goers. Hmm. What is actually over here? Like, is there a reason for me to go farther? Uh, not really. Not no, really. I've I've seen it. I've I've seen better. Yeah, there's not a lot out here. That I think if, I want to deal if, with. I think if, I want to just. If this is about me. We can leave. <laughs> uh, no, I, I just haven't been to this side of the island before, so I wanted to see if there was anything actually useful to do, and there wasn't. Hmm. We... let's just run away. Also, this coat will be way better if they clean the barnacles off of it, instead of just, like, living with barnacles. <laughs> yeah, like, you, who you're just, doing a bit of the Davy Jones look there. Who just lives with barnacles? Mm, whales. Fair. No, you got me there. You are not <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Jeez. Though people, also great. Oh yeah, let's take a look at this new rapier, see if it's better than the last one. Oh wow, it is way better. It is. I mean, the the fact that it only has 12 strength is bad, or that its attributes are just plus 12 strength is bad, because strength doesn't help me at all. But it is a better, it is more damage. And more damage is good. We, we got some barnacle stands in the chat. People who think that aesthetic is good, but you know, fair play <laughs> to you, fair play to you. You are allowed to be wrong. Harvest that dope kush. We're using it for its intent, we're using hemp for its historically more common purpose. And it almost makes me sad. And yeah, uh, this dude. So gear in this game uh, takes the, follows the same logic as Jesus. Let's just steer clear of this. Uh, follows the same logic as like Diablo loot systems, of where there's a whole bunch of name modifiers that have certain attribute modifiers attached to them and so it's just of the druid gives you intelligence on that oh, weapon boy. just because rhyme reason logic or sense nope it just it just does is this a good idea in your historical game to do no is it a good idea in your MMO? Frankly, also no. <laughs> did they do it anyway? You sure bet they did. What's the giant Pokeball? Uh, uh, ancient. Okay, cool. Yeah, that makes sense. It it, it do be old stuff.
ballsy of them. <laughs> Not incorrect. Also, I just want to point out these trees. The fact that these are just generically young trees. When all the generically old trees are, um... For some strange and bizarre reason, uh, mangroves? Potentially? Yeah. Potentially? Yeah. Not clear. I think they, they just wanted the gnarly root aesthetic. I think they did too. Not where, where a mangrove tree would grow. And this is a young tree. It's a maple? I think it's a maple. These tree these leaves are awfully low res PNG for me, but I think I think I'm gonna go with a maple. Oh, by the way, I haven't told you the craziest thing yet. Uh, I'm going to point this out to every single stream because it doesn't get less insane as soon as I kill this wolf. Right. In the eternal quest to figure out is this alt history, is this fantasy, is there somewhere in between what on earth is happening? We came up with... Where are you? Documents. Ow. Tales of First Light. Okay, Rose, no, no, De Magneta. So just, I'm in no danger from this guy. So you just take a look at this sentence here. Trappist brought, no, all right. Oh no. As he states, knowledge of magnets is present across all of the world from the earliest Greek and Jewish and Egyptian scholars to far and distant China. Oh boy. Oh boy. Which uh, which uh, part of this do you think is the most bonkers? Cuz I got my answer. I want to hear your answer. <laughs> I mean, the, the fact that in, in spite of everything we've seen so far, apparently Greece and, and Israel and, and China are places that exist in this, this world mm -hmm. just hurts my soul. And, and to me, it's not only that, you know, th that there is, was a Hebrew population that knew about uh, magnets, but that there is a religiously Jewish, right? They're using a generic Euro word for a religious group. Which means that they are saying that like being, Judaism exists? Judaism exists in this game. Oh boy. Like, what do you even do with that information? Replace that they had with a kipper. Hmm? Sorry. I suggested replace your ugly hat with a kipper. Fair, yeah. Also, wait, did you just call my hat ugly? I, I may have. Rude. I, I, I'm not entirely sure anymore. <laughs> I was just caught up in. The blasphemy that was that sentence. <laughs> that sentence is just a lot to deal with at the same time. And the more times I read it, it just doesn't get better. Hooray. We're just getting sailing charts. I don't know why we're getting sailing charts, but we're getting sailing charts. And fighting sure. pirates, who are dressed... Just in case if there was any confusion, that you might know that they're pirates. They're dressed in the most piratey pirate outfits that I've ever pirated. <laughs> and barnacles. And barnacle. Ooh, a soaked rapier. A soaked rapier of the duelist. Is this better than the other? This is, in fact... Oh, sh shit. Uh, I need to actually, like, pay attention and... Hmm. 
deal with my enemies first, and trade out weapons later. Okay, this is way better. Abilities are still on cooldown. Okay. Way better. We're at five of eight sailing charts. We're just gonna keep murdering everyone here. Uh, you didn't even drop me a th the thing you're supposed to. Rude. Also, they for some reason do disease. For, I assume, reasons. And I wish I knew what they were. I wish I knew what those reasons were. The undead creature fitting with boards. Yeah. So, like, I at first I assumed they were at least just you know generic zombie thing where where they're just mindless creatures that only exist to to attack. And now they're Which like they are, but then they also seem to just like huddle around doing things. So are they intelligent? Do they build stuff? No. And again, what does that mean for the ethics of killing them? And for, like, how they function as an allegory? Two excellent questions, and if I ever find an answer, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> Exactly. As usual, this is a game that is so unconcerned with all the questions that it, like, fundamentally has to ask. And it's almost incredible. Hmm. Right? It is... Beyond completely unconcerned. <laughs> With, like, itself. I don't think I've ever seen that in a game before, is the craziest thing. What right, exactly? I, I've played Wait, a lot that, of historical- That, that level of, of disinterest in- Exactly. Exactly that. I, yeah. like, I have played a lot of historical games over the past year and a bit of this channel's existence. Like, we've played a pretty good number of different games, and I've played more than I've... I, I have played more things than I have streamed. And I don't think I've ever seen a game be so unconcerned with every single aspect of its own design. I've seen games that are pretty unconcerned, but not not to this extent where everything is just kind of globbed together. <laughs> and so you end up with what a frigate? I think that's a frigate. Just just hanging out. I'm up. not good with ships. Uh, I'm not good with ships either. Uh, but right. It's definitely a ship, though. D I think. Fair. <laughs> it's almost certainly a boat. Uh, but in every aspect, right, we're just doing stuff. Right, we've got the most generic pirates glumped next to the most generic conquistadors glumped next to indigenous people, question mark? Uh, glumped next to uh, zombies that might have, like, an ethics to them. Glump next to mangroves on the side of a hill nowhere close to the water. It's just... it's just... 
all glomped together in this weird hodgepodge that does mm. stuff. How are the reviews for the thing being? You know, I haven't really looked up what reviews from, like, games journalists have been. Uh, John, Professor John Harney of History Respond said mm -hmm. it really, really well, though, of that the game is... In a lot of ways, exactly what a lot of people, I think, want, which is an MMO that has a fairly clean UI and is fairly simple to get into. It succeeds at that admirably. But at the same time, it encourages the player to act like a psychopath. And that <laughs> yeah. you are perpetually squabbling over perpetual nothings that are completely meaningless and you're murdering indiscriminately and harvesting indiscriminately, and generally being a horrible human being in the pursuit of these endless, like, faction squabbles. Hmm. Uh, but it's also very fun. <laughs> yeah, I guess. It's strange. Uh, strange creator. Uh, I haven't seen any indigenous people so far in 60 hours into the game. Also, I don't think I've seen you in chat before, so welcome. You are correct. You know, that's something I want to get on. I want to get, uh, soon, a specialist in indigenous American cultures, uh, especially if I can locate someone who knows anything about, uh, maritime mm. aspects to those cultures, because if you look at where it is on the map, the odds of someone sailing east and running into it Completely, completely plausible, and yet, as far as I know, there's no settlements that are actually explicitly, like, indeed from American cultures. Uh, yes, we saw the innkeeper in Monarch's Bluffs is a person of color with a British accent. So we, and... The artificer in this, by the way, uh, has a Korean name. Hmm. Oh dear, it's about time you've returned. Let's see what you found. Great Scott. Something. Those damned pirates so are planning okay. to set sail to leave Eternum. That's what I'd like to know. They plan to set sail right after the return of the expedition into the ruins of Seafor. I think that you're being... I have serious doubts about our constable's priorities. If Sylvia and the traitors from Nyhots were involved in the, the expedition uh -huh. never returned. Uh -huh. So the answers we uh -huh. lie in the ruins of Okay. The guardians there are... Oh, look at how fancy and blue my rapier is. Find whatever remains of the expedition. Hmm. I like that. That's a nice color palette. <laughs> Why is it blue, though? Yeah, uh, because it drowned. It's soaked. Therefore, it's like the blue-green. Okay. That's totally how that works. Yep. Yep, Strange Creator, you are right. The Guardians are... We've been trying the whole stream to figure out who, who on Earth, what on Earth, the, uh... Pirates act or the guardians actually are, and why they are, and we've been failing quite dramatically. I wouldn't be say honest. we 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 failed. Gave it's, up. It's more that I don't. <laughs> I don't think they they ultimately, um, thought this through. So the um the implications are are all over the place, and they're mostly. Not good implications. The implications are extremely not good. Cause yeah. Yeah, but the 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 undead pseudo indigenous um yeah monsters to kill basically. Yeah, not a good look. Not not the best not look I've ever seen. If I don't know if any any of the people who came late are are interested enough to to um. Look the uh, look at the recording later. Uh, we we talked about that fairly early on in the stream. Uh, all, all the different um 
colonialist tropes um that um that these are uh, weird not indigenous undead people touch upon um yeah yeah there are there are a lot uh and i think it is actually also significant that we didn't touch on uh that the guardians are skeletal but colonists are zombie in the media sense not the religious sense huh. right right because right the undead pirates and the undead farmers and the undead miners and the undead basically euro people are all have like rotting flesh these guys are just mm. straight up pure skeleton i did not consider that i don't really know what to make of it but it feels pres like sufficiently significant to acknowledge mm. Especially in light of the ways that... What the f... What was that weird glowy light? It... it shoots... It shoots lasers? Fire? Something? I got no clue. Also, that's... you... you can make these guys... As it turns out, you can make... Uh, skeletons bleed in this game. You'll love to see it. Yeah, I mean... That makes sense, I guess. Oh, well that spawned another guy. He just spawned another guy. For no obvious... But, yeah, what... what um, what uh, Blue says is is ultimately probably the reasoning be behind them being skeletal. But it only raises all the more questions. If there are people here who have been here long enough to, um, to be decomposed to be skeletons, then there have been indigenous groups here before. Correct. I mean, obviously we have these temples, so it's all. Yeah, it all moves in in circles. It. It doesn't form a single logical picture. And every time we think we're at all closer to getting past that, to making progress, it just it just comes back. There is like I think there are no answers to be had here, just deeply concerning questions. Yeah. It's it's it goes back to where where we started at, the fear of going native, the fear of becoming like the people here and just because this is an unsubtle fantasy allegory um the people here are undead monsters all right sure why not 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 even the worst thing indigenous americans have been called i'm not even sure it's like top 10. <laughs> Cover ex so somewhere in on this place there are expedition notes that I need to locate, by the way. This is the last quest we're going to do today, is to go uh, over into this another indigenous site uh, in the Elder's Bluffs and figure out what the heck happened when people tried to go dungeon crawling. Uh, and I suppose that's another angle that is worth acknowledging and exploring. Is the fact that there's a, a big old history of like, you know, like fantasy media requiring dungeon crawling and mm -hmm. therefore ancient places to crawl. Let's, let's just call it, you know, looting, tomb robbing. <laughs> I um. mean, that implies that any of those places have any relationship to uh, tombs. Like, yeah, in fair, any... fair. It's just, um... That due to the whole dungeon crawl thing, looting almost has too positive a ring already. Because sure, loot box, cool. Um, 
But yeah, this is this is just stealing. Uh, true. Right. That that's the main reason why I don't call it like tomb robbing is because none of those entity, nothing in any dungeon, be it Skyrim, Diablo, Baldur's Gate, whatever, has anything that can actually be deemed. Called a tomb. Yeah. Right, that implies a level of thought into how the culture works, that yeah. very few uh, of these games actually, like, acknowledge or want to acknowledge. So, uh, I don't like, I don't like that terminology or using, and also, you know, gamifies what is, to be frank, an abomination. Uh, right, a legitimate historical abomination. It just gamifies it into... A thing that players... I guess even can do? It's... Right. Instead of getting at the... Fundamental lack of empathy... I don't know, that, that's complicated, that's a tricky one. Uh, my thought is not fully formed on that, <laughs> and I really should be more cautious about fully forming the thoughts. Very oh, fair. In the meantime, I'm just going to say thank you to Strange Creator for calling the channel interesting. Oh yes, and for following. Uh, I am 100% going to drown here because uh, we swim. Yep. Oh. You, you, you can just let it talk. The bottom of the that's that's not how water w works. There's, I cannot swim in this video game. What <laughs> is this? Why? <laughs> how? You just walk around at the bottom, yeah. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah. So I guess swimming pools aren't a thing in this world either. I'm guessing not. No. Uh, so let's try that again, this time with feeling, and, um... Yeah, let, let, let's try that again one more time, where you can get into our, this, see what an actual quote-unquote dungeon looks like a little bit more, and then we will call it a stream. Yeah, yeah you know, it's a good, it's a good idea, stream <laughs> creator, except for, uh... I have I have to breathe. And we cannot put a boat over our head. So we just lose and die. Hmm. It's unlucky. Severely unlucky. <laughs> Jay Pasco, this world had Greece, but not Archimedes. You're not wrong. <laughs> uh, you missed me attempting to swim, Sisostris. That's pretty much it. I tried to swim. It didn't go well. We're doing the salty run back. Despite drowning in fresh water. I think. Nitri Maybe? Nitrina does raise a good point. Is is the whole nothing can die here thing just another um I, Pirates of the Caribbean steel? I mean definite maybe. <laughs> I hate that I answer that with a definite maybe, but it's a definite maybe. I can't discount the possibility because there is no evidence to the contrary. Hmm. And that feels real bad. Hey, uh, don't mind me. <laughs> <laughs> you missed. Gonna have to try harder. Uh, oh shit, he hit me. Uh, I shouldn't have marked him. Okay, hey, we're gonna take a look at this. We're gonna take a look at this. Ow. Once we've made it up the... Once we are in safety, we'll take a look at that document.
Why are we trying to continue the work of an expedition that gave up? <laughs> By the way, I just realized that our objective is to journey into Serkor and continue the work of the Lost Expedition. Who who thought this was a good idea? I mean, historically, it's it's kind of a thing that happens. Oh like, yeah. Like colonizing Florida, I mentioned it earlier, took a, a number of attempts. They just kept throwing people at it until they managed to not die. Not dying in Florida is harder than it looks. No, I think it's exactly as hard as it looks. <laughs> <laughs> it's Florida! I, don't know, I mean, with so many old people, you, you'd think it would be relatively safe. Okay. Now. Journal. Documents. Uh... Uh, because Strange Creator asks, Florida is that penis-like appendage hanging off North America in the East. Um... No, it's just um, in the in the 16th century, really, really difficult uh, for the Spanish to colonize for a number of reasons uh, that that have to do with environmental factors and like just it doesn't work the way they're used to by now from from other areas in the Americas where they have relatively centralized um, political structures. So they they just take out the government and take over. And um, um, Florida and, and North America inland from Florida is just a lot lot more um, politically fractured. And then, yeah, it's, it doesn't have uh, traditional agriculture like that. They're used to a lot of cultures depend on fishing or on hunting for subsistence. Uh, they are semi-nomadic, um, meaning they have like uh, temporary settlements. They stay out for a while and then they move on. Um, and so on. So it really just doesn't work well for the, the way that the Spanish have learned to, to take over in the Americas. Ancient coffer. It has totally usable modern materials. Sandpaper. Yeah, that's that's super ancient thing, I promise. Yeah. Yep. Definitely didn't have to use, you know, planes because you can't sand things. No. Oh, hey, look, it's another one of these guys. But we can get closer this time. I mean... Are we sneaky? Blue, blue. I know it's it's kind of pithy... Um, pithy weight. A uh, pithy thing to, to say at this point, but yeah, I'd, I'd rather return Florida, Florida to the uh, native nations in the area rather than the Spanish. But yeah, the, the point stands, I guess. Did you stop? Neutrina asks why why no one has reused the stone from the ruins to build new stuff, which is a very good question. An absolutely I mean, excellent question that I have no answers to apart from we need a place that's old. Guys, in, give us a place that's old. I mean, Blue in his in his video are city minutes for for the uh, Native Americas, the uh, the OSP video that came out a few days ago, which was. Very good. Or actually, did it come out yesterday? I don't uh, know. Time is a, two, is a today's fiction. Sunday. Today's two days ago. <laughs> um, yeah, showed showed some um nice examples of of Spanish colonial buildings really just built on top of Inca foundations, and then you have things like buildings in modern day Mexico City where just like 
a jaguar head um stands out from the corner of the building or something because um a, a piece of um of uh aztec um architectural decoration was just reused stuff like that so yeah um Neutrina is absolutely right. Stones don't stay in place. They they get reused. But I guess they don't if there's murderous skeleton creatures hanging around them. That that might make a difference. You know that that's that's reasonable. These murderous skeleton creatures are kind of horrible, and I don't enjoy them. Yeah, but I don't think they enjoy you either. I guess that is really Wait, the le essence of moral relativism, isn't it? Le Leacon the Tudor. Oh boy, what is Does that? Does anyone in the one in the... That looks... Oh, 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 oh no, not weird ritual gestures. Don't make this about killing uh, the also, look evil at that, human sacrifice look, look at that sun headdress. That's clearly a solar yeah. headdress. Let me sneak. Sneaky, sneaky. Yeah, it's... It's just ugly. It does look terrible. It does look absolutely... A absolutely bafflingly bad. Uh, but again, right? It, it's like... It's so... It's so close to being a reference to Mesoamerican, but then it just... It doesn't go far enough to be confident with that, but if you put feathers instead of this weird, like, orangey red yeah. shit in between them, I'd have no problem saying that that is Aztec. That, but also, like, just just the idea of, of sneaking up to, to someone who is apparently performing some kind of religious ritual, which is obviously evil because this creature is evil. Of and course. now you're going to kill the creature. The creature is abject and is fundamentally evil. Let's go. Yes. So freaking uncomfortable. Yep, let's do it. Oh, I missed. Uh, I missed. It's fine. It's fine. Oh, whoa, whoa, what? I didn't know, realize he had a mask. I didn't realize he had a mask. Uh... Hmm. Like, what is this? What is this? Like porcelainy face mask thing? Yeah, that does not look indigenous American. Yeah, no, no, it does not. Not even slightly. So once again, the oh, it's actually not it not porcelain. Me of most, it's not porcelain. It's bronze. What it reminds me of most is like the the stupid uh, silver mask in the like. What's it called? Kingdom of Heaven movie? True! The stupid Crusader movie? True! Also, apparently the zombie, you know, the skeletons don't hurt the rabbits that are just running around. Well, I wouldn't hurt the rabbits either, they're cute. True. True. You're Not wrong. Just going to kill one now to prove a point, aren't no, you? No, no, no. Not this time. Oh right. no! They're actually going into religion. Also, they call it anthropology what? instead of archaeology. Why? Huh? Short ship knife blade, a long metal spike, and a metal grate over the fire pit. Oh boy. That sure is. Do be a thing. Where is the. Wait, where is the. Tutelary Regent? Isn't that the guy up this way that I already killed once? Isn't that this Don't guy know. right here? Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay. It sadly wasn't the guy, you know, that I hoped it would be. I was hoping to kill this guy again just to spite him. Just to spite the guy up there for having a stupid face mask. I was hoping to have to kill mm -hmm. him again. Uh, 
No. Do the thing. Well, that best. So, again with the... With the, like, um... A veil like thing hanging from the hand that again feels so mm, near eastern. Yes. That's, the, the aesthetic is just, yeah, non European. It's other. It is um, extremely other. It, it just tries to, to be foreign in like the broadest, most uncomfortable sense imaginable. I'm gonna go find a quiet spot. The, train, the biggest lie in the game is that the archaeologist came up with only two theories for what the bull is. That is... That is fair. That is extremely fair. Uh, but I want to take a look. I don't know... Yeah, quest items. Can we zoom in on this in any meaningful way? No? Please? Ancient clay statuary. Firstly, you're calling a crude, which I hate. Secondly, crude but expressive. Oh, indeed. God. Secondly, like you could have done so much cooler with that. It does look Neolithic, uh, or Sumerian. Man, I would no Sumerian needs bigger eyes. Um, yeah, Neolithic. Neolithic seems fair. Mm. I know, right? That that groan of increasing frustration is my mood all the time <laughs> at this video game. <laughs> Isn't it great? Isn't it lovely to be here? <laughs> We're approaching the point where we would really rather be somewhere else. <laughs> That's okay. As soon as we turn in this and see what our deftly fine person back in town thinks of this thing, we are going to call it a night. So just 656 more meters to walk, and then we oh, will good. be done. I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> um, no, just this. Um, yeah, I, I guess blues the musical style presses it pretty well. <laughs> makes makes you glad you never Ow. played the game yourself. <laughs> Because yeah, the the best, like you said, the best thing you could say about it is that it makes you addicted to killing people. <laughs> You're only acting a little bit like a psychopath. It's fine. Right, I've got PvP turned off even, so like I'm not even engaging with any of that. At some point, we will need to spend a stream just seeing how many ethics violations the syndicate asks, asks us to do. <laughs> just, ow. just for the fun of it, just do exclusively syndicate quests to figure out exactly how bad it gets. <laughs> I've had some big action movie vibes, just the, the spear striking the... Um, the stone just above your head. Oh, that has some big. <laughs> yeah, that that was the, you. You said that right after I got what? <laughs> Do we find mo? I don't think Animal Crossing ever did. I encourage you to be a filthy capitalist, but not a psychopath. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Actually, there are some really compelling uh, anti-capitalist. Analyses uh, of Animal Crossing yeah, and its flaws. I was about to say you, you have loans without interest and stuff like that. Yeah, but right, ultimately you're doing an, econ an environmentally exploitative materialist thing where the the acquisition of resources for the purposes of selling is ultimately the whole point of the game. It's incredibly chill while you do it. But, right, in comparison to something like Stardew Valley, where financial considerations ultimately, like, aren't important at all, and instead the community Fair. building is, 
Animal Crossing is extremely capitalist. Fair, yeah. Ooh, so, so stress. If you can find some images of those, uh, there are a couple of terracotta figures from the Neolithic Danube that are reminiscent of the clay figure we got. So, uh, if you can find some pictures of those, drop those in the Discord, and we'll continue talking about it. And also, in general, uh, type exclamation mark Discord right now uh, for a link to the Discord if you are not yet there. We both, uh, Sacerdos and I, are in there, and we are happy to keep talking about this game and or losing our minds. To return from We're also happy to talk about pretty much anything else. Yeah, pretty much. It really doesn't matter ultimately. Uh, we've talked about lots of things on there. Where do you get... Wait, from the notes we got of this quote-unquote anthropologist, where, where do you... Where are you getting that interpretation from? Much less that a random-ass Neolithic figurine is going to do that. Uh, Mortal Nightwolf, I do not know what that is about either. I am not participating in anything that Amazon is running to get streams. I am a historian by training. I am joined by another historian by training. We are talking about how this game is mega colonialist and does not even pretend to care about that. Yeah, it, it does, it's it good does fun. not pretend good fun. to care about anything. It's Really anything. In, in many regards, it's kind of lovelessly done. Exactly. Hooray. Uh, but, we are coming right up on the end of the stream, so... Uh, of doing Red Dead Online, I think I would rather do Red Dead Redemption 2, uh, Strange Creator. But it is a game on the list for when I have more resources and more time to look things up. Uh, so, anyway, make sure you are followed. Uh, we will be back with this with a different guest. Uh, probably next week Tuesday, but we'll be flexible depending on schedules. The idea is we are going to have, uh, I'm going to, but I am going to bring on a different guest pretty much each week to be able to talk about a different aspect of how this game is colonialist, different raids, cultures, etc. in the game, uh, and generally experience the absolute travesty that is this video game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll be playing it for a hot second, but I stream, uh, three times a week. So currently, uh, coming up this week at 2 p.m. Eastern time. We're going to have Assassin's Creed Valhalla. That is the launch of the Discovery Tour, so we are going to do a full playthrough of that, where I will give my thoughts, opinions, as someone with a graduate degree in Viking history. Uh, then, for Halloween, we are doing Castlevania Symphony of the Night, so we'll have the rest of that to do. Uh, so we'll, we're in Castle B right now, or the Upside Down Castle, so you're going to just hang out have a slightly more casual thing for Halloween. And then at the end of the month, Age of Empires 4 launches. So if you want that <laughs> sweet, sweet historical context, we got some big games coming up. It's so good. So make sure you're following, make sure you try and make as many of the streams as you can. It's more fun when people are talking, hanging out, having a good time. So, this concludes I definitely today's... had fun. I'm glad. I had a great time having you on. Thank you so, so much, Sacrados. Thank you for having me. And thank you to um, Mortal Night Wolf for following. Yes. I think you missed that. Yes, just at the end here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for following. Uh, do you have any final thoughts about this game or y your early, mo what we've been talking about with early modern colonialism and empire formation? I guess, um, I guess my my summary is it's it's exactly what you expect when you hear. There's a game called New World that's about totally ethical, n no worries, no guilt colonization. Um, it's just it doesn't engage with any of the, the possible implications at all. It, neither does it really manage to clean up um, its setting the way it wants to. It's just, it's just a mess. It runs into all of the problems it should have been aware of. Exactly. That's, that's my summary, I guess. 
not to mention the logistics of how the fuck do you get a boat up that this far up a cliff? <laughs> yeah, I guess. Really bad storm. On an extremely basic level, how the how the absolute hell did they get no. the boat up there? Magic. True. True. With the wizard power did it. with the Don't powers of Azoth, we will do it. The power of sparkly blue goo will let us do anything. Hmm. So. All right then. Uh, yes. We hope to see lots of people on here again. Mhm. Mm uh, when when I'm just hanging out in the chat next time. So. So yes. Until next. Bye week. everyone. Yep. Have a good rest of your weekend, and we will. S I will see you all on Tuesday, hopefully. See ya.